All right, all right. Today we're talking about the components of a radiographic unit here at How Radiology Works. This is going to be a complete tutorial about all the pieces of a radiographic unit coming up. The patient is often lying on the table. We'll talk also about standing positions as well. And then you have a bucky, and within that bucky, you can have a cassette that can actually contain a CR cassette. We'll talk just a minute about what computed radiography is, as well as it could contain a detector. That's in the case of digital radiography. Your x-rays actually come from something we call an x-ray tube. We then have something that we call a collimator that'll actually block the extra x-rays so you can control actually what we call the field of view or the amount of a radiated region on your patient. The x-rays will then pass through the patient to some degree, a lot of the x-rays will end up stopping in the patient. So what we actually make an image of is actually the difference between the x-rays that keep going through the patient and the x-rays that stop in the patient. Sometimes there's x-rays that are gonna get scattered in the patient. That's actually gonna lead to a background haze in our image due to scatter. But at a high level, we go from x-ray tube, pass through the collimator, through the patient, through the table, and then we have what we call an anti-scatter grid here, which is little septa to try and block that scatter. We have actually something called an operator console, which actually is connected and will send a signal from the computer to actually trigger the x-rays to be on. The operator console actually could be stationary like this, and it is typically gonna be on the other side of leaded glass to minimize the radiation exposure during the acquisition. It's also possible for a mobile unit to have an actual console which is attached to the actual unit or comes with it such that when you wheel that around, you'll have that operating console, the ability to make your prescription right then and there. We've got more videos on the channel about all these components, including the x-ray tube, but we'll start here at the top where the x-rays get generated, we have something called an x-ray tube. You have a glass housing, or what we call a vacuum tube, to remove the extra air molecules. The way we generate the x-rays in our x-ray tube is send electrons in, those electrons hit a heavy metal hard, and then out come x-rays. In order for those electrons to get pulled over to hit that heavy metal hard, we need what we call a high voltage potential. Here's an image of that. We have what we call the cathode is where those electrons get boiled off. So there's something called a filament that we heat really hot. The electrons get boiled off, then they will get pulled over and hit an anode hard, and then out come the x-rays. On modern tubes, we also have this anode. Instead of being just a stationary piece of metal, it's actually gonna rotate around so that we have more ability to hit different parts on that anode so that the anode gets a chance to cool. Thus, we can have a higher incident on the anode without melting the anode. But if we want the anode to actually be rotating, we need something to make that anode rotate. So we use a motor for that. Regular induction motors have two parts. There's a rotor, which is in the middle. That part rotates. So you can think of it rotor rotates. And then there's a part on the outside which is called a stator, and that part's stationary, or it doesn't move. So that's how you can remember those two parts. And this rotor, actually, a nice thing is that on our systems, that actually can be on the inside, and then the other stator can be on the outside. The rotor's inside the vacuum, and the stator's outside the vacuum. This whole piece here, we call an insert for our x-ray tube. And on the outside of this whole thing, we actually have a housing, which is a leaded housing in order to reduce the stray radiation. If we just had a stationary anode, it would look something like this, where the electrons would come in, they would hit our heavy metal like tungsten, and then they could come out. You don't need a high power rated tube in order to take pictures of a few teeth because you only have to pass through the jaw. So for a dental system, this is gonna be sufficient, where you come in, you hit your tungsten, and then out come the x-rays. But for radiography systems, fluoroscopy systems, for computed tomography systems, they all are gonna require a higher duty, actually rotating anode. The electrons will come in, they will hit the anode, and then the x-rays will come out down here. So we can think about it, the heat can get distributed along this whole track for the actual anode. Another view of a picture of what we called the insert. 
right here is the cathode. Electrons come out, they will hit the anode while it's rotating, and then the x-rays will come down here. This is the insert, so this has the rotor or the rotating part as well. X-ray tubes are made up of different heavy metals for the anode. Tungsten is the most popular one, but molybdenum and rhodium also can be used for mammography where you have actually a smaller breast that you're imaging compared with the whole body. As far as that motor, this is a cross section of how an inductor motor works. Again, the rotor on the inside and the stator on the outside. And the rotor is just a permanent magnet. So you can think of it having north, south, north, south, different poles here. And then outside is what we call the stator. This is stationary, even though it's a stationary set of electromagnets, they actually change in time. We have an alternating current coming in and we actually are changing in time the magnetic field at each of these magnets so that we basically will set it up so that if you think about one little north pole here, it will get pulled to one electromagnet and then we'll change the field so then it'll get pulled to the next electromagnet. We'll change the field again so it'll continue getting pulled. And so that is what's going to cause our rotor to rotate and that rotor remember is hooked straight to that anode inside of our x-ray tube then coming out of our x-ray tube we have some built-in filtration of the actual window itself from the x-ray tube and then we will typically add a thin layer of filtration see our video on filtration which helps reduce the radiation dose especially to the skin here's a full picture of the x-ray tube we have on the one side, a circuit, and then on the other side, we have the actual physical tube. We have a separate video where we talk about the x-ray circuit, but at a high level, there's a primary circuit, and then there's a secondary circuit and a filament circuit. The primary circuit's the one that's connected to the wall. The secondary circuit is the one that's generating the KV, and the filament circuit is the one that's generating the M. So this is the first time I've talked about KVP and MA. KVP, is actually what we call kilovolt potential. That's the actual electrical potential difference between the cathode and the anode that's gonna pull those electrons across. And the rate of flow of the electrons, that's controlled by what we call the, again, see our video for more details about all the fun transformers, rheostats inside of the circuit here. And then this is just like we talked about, electrons coming from the cathode, hitting the target, and then out come our x-rays. And that is on a rotating anode, which is rotating because we have a rotor that's getting pulled by the stator. Then how to control the actual parameters that we're using, those P and MA, we call those technical parameters of our acquisition. We can control them manually by figuring out how large the patient is, what type of exam it is, and then we can set those parameters manually. Alternatively, the systems now have ways that we call automated exposure control, and this automated exposure control actually takes a measurement during the acquisition to see how many x-rays have actually passed through the patient, and thus how good a quality of the x-ray image we're gonna have at that given time. Once there's enough x-rays that have passed through, then the automated exposure control says, turn off the acquisition. So automated exposure control just sets the duration of your x-ray acquisition. We've got separate videos completely going over the AEC. The x-rays as they pass through, there's air inside that ion chamber. X-rays have high enough energy, they can actually strip off electrons from those air molecules. And then that is what is measured inside of an ion chamber, the positive and negative charges. In our AEC video, we go through all the details on the outside of your system, you can actually see where those chambers are, and you want to make sure your anatomy is completely contained within those chambers. So don't try and image a little finger that's only gonna take up part of a chamber, and don't put a piece of metal in there because you're gonna get a spurious reading. Also, don't use gonad shielding in AEC. Gonad shielding is something we have separate video on, which is really phasing out in radiography in modern times. If you do have to set those KV and MA parameters manually, see our video on the KV and MA parameters. You do want to understand that as a radiologic technologist, the trade-offs between KV with that one controlling the contrast and the penetration. So setting that one first, setting your Bucky or your anti-scatter grid, 
because you will need a higher dose in order to get the same exposure on the detector. Then you can set your MA and your exposure time. They all will influence the exposure that you're gonna get and the quality of the image which you're gonna get. I've talked mostly about the standard radiography system so far, but fluoroscopy is basically making x-ray movies. So you'd like to do low dose acquisitions, but do several of them in a row so you can get a sense of someone swallowing something or if you're inserting a catheter, you can track the tip of that catheter. You could inject iodine in an interarterial injection, which is actually higher contrast. All of these things you can do under fluoroscopy. We've got a few videos on fluoroscopy on the channel as well. See those for more details on fluoroscopy. In fluoroscopy, you typically traditionally have used an image and that actually has electron optics inside of your image intensifier. So see our video about how that image intensifier works. We now have flat panel detectors, which to a large part are displacing those image intensifiers as they can keep up with the frame rates and they have some desirable qualities can paired with image intensifiers in that they don't change brightness as a function of x-ray dose, for instance. In a standard radiography system in first world countries, you're reading out the image and you're gonna be reading that out either with computed radiography or with digital radiography. In computed radiography, you take the acquisition, there's then a latent image which is stored on that panel in an analog manner, and then you take that panel, you bring it over to a CR reader. That CR reader is going to digitize that image. That CR reader is also connected to your workstation such that you can send to PAX the x-ray image after it's been digitized. We've got separate video on the CR panels themselves. They store a signal which is proportional to the x-ray exposure. And when you add a little bit more energy to that panel by shooting light on it, it actually pushes the energy that's stored inside over a little limit, and then light actually comes out of the panel. So if you shine a laser on it, then it's visible light that comes out of the panel that's proportional to how much x-ray hit the panel originally. So you can actually scan over your whole panel in a raster manner, moving that laser light, and then collecting your optical light and seeing how much optical light comes out when you shine the laser at a certain part of the panel. That's what's happening inside of those CR readers. CR actually is digital because that process that we just talked about is digitizing a signal in comparison with film, which was just analog. But CR now is also getting replaced to a large extent. Direct digital radiography. There's technology for flat panel detectors, which is based on cameras, there's technology for flat panel detectors, which is based on what's inside of a modern monitor. There is a direct conversion flat panel detector, which is especially good for mammography acquisitions. See our video on flat panel detectors for more details on the differences between these type of flat panel detectors. So after you've taken the acquisition, you have a digital acquisition, then you wanna look at that acquisition on your display as well as send it to PAX. If you're in a fluoroscopy setting, you will also typically have the ability to visualize those images directly above the patient so that you can see them as you're working as a clinical staff, as well as inside of the operating console room. So you might be looking at a prior MR image while you're looking at your fluoroscopy image inside of the operating console room. And you can also see those X-ray images or even your prior images in the room right above the patient. All the fluoroscopy systems and radiography systems also need to have a recording system. In the old days for fluoroscopy, this was actually a separate because you'd have a tape-based system to actually do the recording. Nowadays that everything's digital, it can all be digitized on the computer directly. So you have a method to actually record your acquisitions. Just like we have automated exposure control for radiography, we have automated exposure rate control for fluoroscopy. And what that means is we're controlling the rate of x-rays. So we're controlling the dose per unit time. So that's why we call it the rate of x-rays. This also used to be called automatic brightness control because on image intensifiers, the brightness of your image 
actually depended on the radiation dose. So that old term of ABC, automated brightness control or automated exposure rate control, those are the same things. And it's just taking into account how large your patient is in order to set KV and then the actual exposure on your system. In a lot of scenarios, like we talked about, the patient is gonna be lying down on a table. In some scenarios, they're gonna be standing up. The table on your system actually is often gonna be made of carbon fiber material because that is actually relatively sturdy so you can have a large patient lying on there in a safe manner. It also is nice because it attenuates less x-rays than a lot of other materials. So x-rays that actually stop in the table don't go on to contribute in a positive manner to the image, so you'd like to have less x-rays stop in that table. Another cool thing about these tables is some of the tables can actually tilt so that you can actually do imaging either horizontally in a slight tilt or in a total vertical manner. Again, underneath that table on those kind of systems is our bucky, and we can have either a stationary grid or it could be a movable grid. These are named after Gustav Bucky, who actually was the first person to test out these x-ray grids for radiography. You can have a fixed Bucky, a so-called floating Bucky, which you can move around, an oscillating Bucky, which is gonna move your grid back and forth such that you don't have any artifacts in your image from the actual grid lines, from where those actual septa land on your image. You can have either a horizontal Bucky, if it's built into a table, we often call that a table Bucky, or you can have a vertical Bucky if you're gonna be doing standing radiographs. We have separate videos talking about filtration. Coming out of the x-ray tube, there's a desire to do a basic amount of filtration, such that the complete beam has some level of filtration. It's also possible to use what we call compensating filters. So a compensating filter is adding on more filtration just for a certain part of the region of the anatomy. If you have a type of anatomy that you're imaging in x-ray that has more attenuation on one side of the beam than on the other side, that's where something like a wedge filter can come into play, where we would actually have more attenuation in this filter on the side where the patient has less attenuation. If you're imaging a foot, you could use a wedge filter and have a thinner part of that wedge over the thicker part of the anatomy. The idea being that you'd like to have uniform exposure after passing through both this compensating filter and through your patient anatomy. You can use something that's called a trough filter if you're going over the chest because you actually have more attenuation around the heart and less attenuation around the lungs. There's a cool one called a boomerang filter that you can use over the shoulder such that you can have relatively similar amount of exposure on your detector coming out of a shoulder radiograph. That's your whirlwind tour of all the components of an x-ray system. Like we talked about, we've got videos on basically all of these different components. There's lots of places to check out depending on where you thought, ah, this is an area where I'm not quite that strong. I should really check out this video on the x-ray circuit. Or if there's another area where I really want to know about What's the difference between the different flat panel detectors? I should check out that video on digital radiography. So I'll see you in one of those videos coming up.